Welcome back, and uh, our co-hosts this hour, every Friday, John Moore and Ann Morrison have their own program over on Republic Radio, 7 to 9 a.m. CST, Central Standard Time. John and Ann, what are the latest news updates? Well, Dr. Bill, uh, good to be here. I just got a with my adult daughter in uh, Seattle, Washington, just 10 minutes ago. Right. I told her I want her and her husband and, and teenage son to have all their vehicles topped off with fuel and at least $1,000 in $20 bills on cash on hand in the household. I'm very concerned what's going to be happening the next week or so. Uh, right. The reports I'm getting uh, have me as concerned as I've been for, I, I would say, years. Uh, right. Hopefully nothing will happen, but I would consider this a yellow alert con- uh, situation. Uh, the possibility of a nuclear weapon going off somewhere on the planet is a clear and present danger. Along right. with things we've been talking about, such as the uh, the various flu viruses, uh, what's going on in the Middle East with uh, Syria, and, and so forth. So um, right. I, am, I, I want to encourage all our listeners to stop and take a deep breath and consider their own situation. What would you do if, right. for any reason, there, w- the, uh, there was a national emergency where martial law was declared, whether it was a coronal mass ejection, electromagnetic pulse, a nuclear device being set off in the Middle East. What would you do? Are you ready? Do you have your food? Do you have your water filter? Do you have uh, medical supplies and what you need to defend your family? Uh, If you don't, I would encourage people to uh, consider getting and making whatever last-minute preparations they can and then moving forward from there this coming Monday at the beginning of the business week or even over the weekend with the Internet, ordering whatever new supplies they might need to fill in whatever gaps there might be in their personal preparedness. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you, Doctor, I'm, I, it's, I don't want to sound like Chicken Little on one hand, but on the other. When I, when I get new, numerous reports from individual uh, resource, sources that uh, I know and trust, uh, I feel I have to be public about it and do the right thing and, and give a, a prudent warning. Well, let, uh, let me give uh, us some backup of that. I, one of my trainers, Jerry Strybos, his because he worked with the Saudi billionaire, he's on this, these uh, State Department alerts that they sent to his phone. His uh, lady, uh, who is uh, coming back here and going to be in the States in a few weeks' time, but she flies for these, uh, we want to call top billionaires in their private aircraft. Uh, she's a, a senior stewardess, <clears throat> and what Jerry said to me was that, and then, of course, one of the doctors right down in the clinic, Dr. Uh, Barrick and Dr. Heller, mentioned that they saw the State Department alerts that uh, the all of our embassies in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Qatar, etc., are, are closing. Right. And they're going to be closing, like, as of now, uh, to at least the fourth or thereafter, and could be, quote, additional days added to that which means all of our U.S. embassies are closing throughout the Middle East right now. Right. Exactly. That means something big is afoot. Now, um, there's two ways to look at this, and I tell people, always put your thinking cap on before you jump. There's two ways that this can be. Number one, there's a lot of harassment occurring. There was a, a bipartisan vote that was very narrow. Uh, almost put a shackles on the uh, no such agency snooping on Americans, which doesn't make us safer. So that, number one, this could be what I call a 9-11 style event, which is basically they need to scare us into letting us make sure that they continue to snoop right. on us, right. At, right. Uh, number one. And number two, uh, what could be going on is something real, which could be a nuclear terrorism, the uh, spread of a bioweapon, which is, by the way, the SARS-2 and the H3 and uh, H7N9. So um, we have only two ways that you can look at this. It's something real, like SARS is broken out and it's coming, or... They're trying to scare us, or both. Right. There's no in-between. And the fact is that most terrorism occurs when they're having a drill. Uh, if there's a drill anywhere, then get out of the, what I call the, 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 uh, the flash zone, the bioweapon spread zone of the drill. So if there's a drill in your town or city or in your country, get out of town. Because if there's a drill, you can be certain. If they do want to do a false flag terror, it's going to occur when the drill is occurring. Just like the Sarnarov brothers, they, those boys were being warned. We were warned by the Russian secret services more than a year or so beforehand. 
Right. The FBI had even met and, with the family. They, you know, they, they are the Russian military, intelligence services were doing the right thing, warning right. our intelligence services, and and our people did not pay heed. Now, well, no, they, they paid heed, but they they paid here. Here's no, here's the other twist. I'm going to say they paid heed because they wanted them on a long choke chain so they could do their terrorism, because their real well, agenda is to put uh, electronic shackles on us because they kicked them the some 2009 the biometric ID and they were going to do it this past May, but now they're trying to attach it with a gang of eight bill with the senators, and now they want to attach it to a congressional bill if they can get a bonner over, the, over a, a, you know, to, on side to, to go for this. The fact is that the biometric ID is part of the mark of the beast system, and they want it in by next May. By next, well, May. next May isn't it? But next May is not that far away. The, the, right. the job of military intelligence, doctor, is to find out what's going to happen before it happens, and I've known that for 45 years. And people like myself and U.S. radio talk show hosts, we each of us have our own list of contacts and networks, and and we right. talk to each other. Uh, what I'm doing amounts to a private intelligence service with right. people I'm connected to, and. Uh, these connections and the reports I'm getting, just to, I know I'm, I'm uh, at risk of repeating myself, uh, I am very, very concerned that, that over the next week or two weeks, uh, a major event is going to take place. That's why, uh, and I don't do this very frequently, when I call my daughter and tell her to top off the fuel tank, uh, I am doing something I rarely, rarely right, do. Well, that's what I just well, did 15 minutes ago. Well, Big Sister decided that she's now leaving the agency, the uh, DHS, uh, and Napolitano. And one of the main warnings she made in the past year is that we cannot stop a container containing a nuke. We're not talking about a suitcase nuke. We're talking about a container-sized one. Right. And the reason is they don't check every cargo uh, ship coming in through the Freeport Bahamas. It literally is the opening port for things coming into America. And the agents that are allowing tra traffic to come in in containers our PLA, People's Republican Army from Hutchinson, Wampoa, the largest seaport on the eastern seaboard is not American, it's in Freeport, Bahamas. On the west coast, Costco is owned Long, by Long Beach by the Communist Chinese. And I know from all my contacts inside the government that all the military weapons that arm the gangs, including everything from AK-47s to body armor to guillotines, are being made in China and shipped to America in advance of whatever the hell they're going to do next. The right. million man's uh, army that they built with DHS, Obama already has his, if you want to call it, centurion guard. Uh, he's ready. Uh, people don't understand that, that whether it's him or the next character in the office of the presidency, they have made a turnkey totalitarian state easy. And they now move to a new phase where they will, are open. They're not hiding it underground anymore. They're coming out and saying, yeah, we're monitoring you. And yeah, get used to it. And yeah, if we didn't do it, you'd be dead. You know, right. live with it, and then they got well, idiots like Christie that up until his, fairly recently they 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 were trying to they had the British spying on us and us spying on the British. Now they're just out hmm. openly doing it on us on us themselves. Well, I heard uh, William Binney, who's the CIA, uh, you know, we call the original CIA uh, whistleblower. His site is whistleblower dot com. I was listening uh, to a Coast to Coast article, and he was an excellent guy. So we probably tried to get him on the program, and he made a. Very profound statement. He said, "In the past, it used to be a country that had government. Now we have a government that has a country." <laughs> and, I like that. I, and like I thought that was a very good analogy. That sounds like a deagleism. This guy's on the same tracks, you know, because right. that man he crystallizes it down to a metaphor that says, "If they have the goods on you, they got you. They know what magazines you read, who you talk to. They got data stream analysis. And don't tell me about the crap about metadata and all this crap." I know about Promise software and AI systems. I worked on all kinds of advanced things, and they tried to recruit me to work on a super soldier program. I took care of employees working on the Virtual World Project, which is at Sri Air Force Base, three higher levels of security than NORAD, and took care of some employees up to six years after I was even working there formally. Super, super so, soldier program. Would that have been around 1982, 83? 1978, UCLA VA Hospital in conjunction with UC... Yep. I was looking at maybe becoming one of those super soldiers back in 79 and 80 and 81. They were doing everything. They, of course, we talk about this with the hack gene, the human artificial chromosome. They've now, DARPA has come out and said, yeah, we built it. So what? Human artificial chromosomes to create super soldiers is great in news today. You can look at it for us through Judge Drudge in Google News, Yahoo News, etc. Blockade is what killed them. 
Welcome back. And uh, watching a program the other day with uh, the very bright uh, Mishu Kaku, and he talks about, of course, his super soldier suit with the nanofibers and the uh, coil springs that have a very powerful combination of fast and strong using alcohol vapors. And, of course, the super suit was using micromagnetometers. When uh, I was recruited to work on the Super Soldier program, they were using a supercooled uh, with liquid nitrogen squid helmet to use the forms of magnetometers to convert thought through a quarter so, so a, a helmet. They would use these magnetometers to convert thought directly you know, on board <coughs> commands of a, a starfighter, <coughs> a jet fighter. And the uh, you make, micromagnetometers are made now so small you can actually make a helmet that looks like just a normal helmet, like a flip, uh, air, you know, fighter fighter helmet. And those uh, can convert thought directly to onboard commands or shine the specific icons on their glasses, like Google Glasses. And uh, you can actuate uh, ordinances or fly by thought, which is six times faster than fly by wire even. So <clears throat> when people think that, no, they're not trying to bring a world of Gattaca with a hack or human artificial chromosome, chromosome 47, it's all in the news. In fact, I'm going to post it up today. You can actually read all the articles. So when people do argue in the past that it doesn't exist, so what do you think about that, John? Well, it, it sounds like Star Wars coming to life to me. Uh, yeah, it's well, we already have Star Wars, by the way. We have fleets. And believe it or not, one of the fleets that we have, which is on the old Aurora, which is, by the way, starting to come out of service in 2010, is the Luftwaffe. Do you know the Luftwaffe never surrendered to the marriage of the Western forces? And part of the deal with transferring over 50,000 technicians, at least 5,000 scientists from Germany, to America, the majority of the scientists went to America, some went to, to Russia, Soviet right. Union, uh, was that the Luftwaffe, which many of these people were members of as well, never surrendered. People don't know that. So did they go to Argentina? Yo, of course, that's where uh, Adolf Hitler died. He didn't die in Germany, and they didn't have his, discover his nose or his body, whatever. No, no, no. Uh, he died years later, I think in his 80s, uh, and... Uh, the fact is that many of these uh, former German scientists and technicians, that's why you can go to Coronado uh, Base, which is a naval base in San Diego, and you can actually see the buildings are in the actual shape of a swastika. Uh, right. Most people don't realize that our so-called agencies like the CIA, DARPA, NSA, etc., are, are fully Nazified. We have a nidus of Nazi ideas inside there, and the Dark Brotherhood, that actually founded, which are basically satanic brotherhood, called the Brother of the Bell, Brotherhood of the Bell, and the uh, these secret orders that formed the Nazis and the uh, the SS squads, because they had their own, by the way, they had their own Bible that had 45 pages of SS, uh, if you want to call it, uh, spiritual literature in the front of the Bible. I actually saw an, an SS Bible many years ago. Really? People don't realize that the SS are very religious. It's a very strange world we live in, sir. It is indeed. I mean, most people don't realize that the world that they believed in, the world they've been told by their churches, their schools, etc., never existed. You know, while we got a couple of minutes here, something I've looked into, and uh, I keep running on a dead end because the best books are untranslated from German, have to do with uh, New Schwabenland, which is the area of the Antarctic that the Germans uh, occupied and probably still occupy. Uh, I, keep, I just keep running on the dead end. My lack of being able to read German has been one of them. But I think it's a fascinating area of study that uh, certainly bears looking into. Uh, well, I can tell you a little bit about Neuschwabenland. Uh, the first thing is the Germans had submarines going back and forth there. And they were looking at ancient documents and maps. <clears throat> they would go back to the map maker that made the maps, by the way, for North America. He also made the maps for Antarctica. The pilot and the maps. maps. That, right. Yeah, and those, by the way, those maps show that Antarctica was not at the South Pole. It was at a different location, which means it was a drift of the actual axis of the North South Pole. So the Antarctica is a relatively recent uh, event. In fact, if you go off the coast of Antarctica, you'll find a frozen forest off the coast of Antarctica. That's right. ba basically... So we know that <clears throat> that the, whatever cataclysmic event happened that created Antarctica, it was a continent with animals and people, etc. It wasn't a dead, dead barren wasteland with Mount Erebus in the center of the largest volcano on Earth. <clears throat> the Swavenland, apparently, they were going to visit... <clears throat> under the ice sheet and under the Lake Vostok, which is the largest 
freshwater lake frozen underneath this uh, giant sea uh, an ice cap. Right. Um, they were uh, visiting an ancient temple. <clears throat> that ancient temple was apparently supposed to house, according to ancient documents that they obtained. Because remember that uh, that uh, the Nazis and the SS and so on were looking up for ancient documents, including the sort of the Spear of Destiny that was supposedly had the power to make sure that empires would stay in power, which is why the Romans uh, carried the Spear of Destiny was later passed on to the various uh, parts of the Roman Empire. And um, the Spear of Destiny, and then they also were looking at other documents to find this temple that was uh, <clears throat> basically buried underneath the uh, ice cap in Antarctica. And uh, so that's why the submarines were there, because they were down there looking for this temple, because they had these maps. And they were looking for otherworldly technology. So, so this otherworldly technology involves things like anti-gravitonics, et cetera, et cetera, that apparently was down there. And that's why when you look at the saucer programs, the British Air Force, I talked to British Air Force pilots as long ago as the 70s, that saw literally you know, squadrons of these, you know, disc-like, uh, you know, we'll call them UFOs. I'm going to call them IFOs, identified fiendish objects. <laughs> <laughs> that we're not, they're not other than our world. They're actually created here. Most people don't realize this, that, a lot of, that we have a lot of advanced technology that we don't talk about. Oh, yes. It's super classified. And, of course, the president, no, that's why they have this book of secrets. But when I look at this book of secrets show on television, I said, this is Mickey Mouse compared to what I know personally, and I'm sure there's a lot more out there. Uh, we know uh, we have anti-gravitonics. We've got space fleets. We have a colony on Mars. We have a, a mining operation on the moon since even before the Eagle landed. Uh, we're doing all kinds of things. We actually, in fact, the first statement that the director of U.S. Space Command said to me and the other docs that we were being recruited in 1994 was, we control every cubic centimeter of space between here and Mars. That's his first statement. And right. we won't want you to freak out, so we're going to tell you everything. We started off with a dark night satellite out at 22,000 miles inside the third belt of the Van Allen radiation belt, larger than the space station. And then when he told us how long it's been up there, he said, we estimate between 13 and 35,000 years. I, I routinely hear 12,000 years, mm. but... Uh, yeah, but he said between... Uh, we're not sure. He said between... Far bad, what's the difference, you know, 12,000... Right, he said somewhere around, you know, 12, 13,000 years to 35. We don't know. So it's really, really old. And he says, and so you don't know if it's ours or theirs. And I said, well, it's probably ours and our civilization fell because all the ancient documents, including the Greeks, who kind of tried to document beyond the pillars of, of uh, the Mediterranean there was this great empire and it fell and of course there are a lot of earth changes so we know that whatever the positions of the continents I think the uh, analysis was I think it's 8 million years ago Alaska was on the equator did you know that? well if you dig down through the permafrost you find <clears throat> tropical plants so why not? right 8 million years ago Alaska was on the equator and wherever Antarctica was, the rotational axis of the Earth moved the lithosphere of the crust in relationship to the mantle. And that has happened before. As it says, like in the Battlestar Galactica, this has happened before. It Absolutely. Happen Doc, I'm going to turn it over to you and Ann and jump out of here. Have a great yeah, weekend. good notice. Uh, I'll tell you, people shouldn't take notice. I don't think this is a crying wolf. <clears throat> when all our embassies close in the Middle East... Uh, Welcome back, and uh, yeah, so when I talked to Jerry Stripos this morning, and he's back to now, I think, six months from Saudi Arabia, and uh, he got a State Department alert that that's what's going on. Now, I tell people <clears throat> um, there's three classes of information we have. The first is we have biblical information that, that says, says standards, that by the biblical standards, you have to have measure everything. And then, of course, the second class is what we call prophetic, which means it has to integrate with that, but it's, it's a higher class of information. And the third class is really good information from really good sources. Things like published articles, whistleblowers, etc. Um, when we look at what's going on, and what do you think of the... Uh, you mentioned just on the break about H1N1 that in Ecuador uh, it, the uh, swine flu is causing 10% case fatality, but you mentioned H7N9 that actually produces per day far more viral particles than any other flu in history, and which means if you ever see a recombinant between these two flus, you'll see what flu that can spread quickly to receptor binding domain with H1N1 because it's been embedded in the human population longer. And then combining with H7N9, which both Chinese and, uh, and uh, 
scientists here in America have stated through our channels and classified channels that these are lab viruses. In fact, uh, one of my young colleagues, now I haven't had him back on the show for a while, he's actually put the website up called labvirus.com, and he's a, quite a character, a musician, etc., up in San Francisco. So um, what do you think, Ann? Well, tell us more about these details. Well, they've, had, uh, they've done mouse studies and parrot studies with the H7 and 9 And uh, one of the things they found is the H7 and 9 infects people through the eyes. So if you think that you're, you're going in to be assessed for H7 and 9 you want to make sure that your doctor is wearing uh, goggles. And if he isn't, then you want to go to a different doctor because he could pass it on to you. Um, in addition, uh, you want to... Avoid touching your eyes, nose, or mouth to help spread the the uh, to help prevent the spread of germs. Now, right. what they did was they um, they wanted to test the uh, H7N9's ability to replicate in cells, and uh, the epithelial cells are the ones that are found in the human respiratory tract. And uh, so they found that uh, compared to the H3N2 virus. The H7 and 9 virus exhibited an 80,000 fold increase in replication in 24 hours. So we have the Armageddon virus, and uh, we have the bond market blow up being pushed by the federal government. We have the Middle East ready to blow up because we have an alert, all our, st- all our uh, embassies are closing. We have the government of Obama still pushing, even after Saudi Arabia almost six months before, pulled the support for a fellow Muslim Brotherhood organization. We have Obama trying to still fund laterally the so-called al-Qaeda terrorists when they've already told us that they got man pads and they want to bring down European and American jets. And we now are starting to get more information, which I posted to talk about the other day, that there were up to 35 CIA operatives on the ground at the time this happened in Benghazi. Many of them got wounded. A number more got dead. And that we don't hear any of this word because what really happened from my sources, which are classified, that we had given through the State Department 67 Stinger Missiles Plus which can take down an aircraft, etc., to the Al-Qaeda, including Al-Nursa elements, which are on the enemy list. And um, we tried to get them back. And the reason why they sent him in there was to try to look like he was, you know, not coming in with a full contingent to protect himself on the most dangerous day of the year to a place that's not secure. And they backed off and made sure publicly that they weren't going to send an air support or anything else to make sure if things went, went down wrong that he and anybody with him died to cover it up. So it was a cover-up before it even happened, is what it was. Uh, the reason is that Obama is so incompetent in the State Department, they actually gave these things because they made a decision, we have to take down Syria. And the thing that stopped it, the same thing with Snowden, and Snowden knows that he would be like many of these other people that are whistleblowers. He'd just be in prison, tortured. God knows what they do to him. Uh, because you can't trust the government. There's no valid, normal ways of actually having whistleblowers speak. So that's what happened there, and I think that we are heading toward tyranny. The problem is the government are freaked out because they know that we're getting on to them. Things like Bitcoin, electronic bartering, uh, peer-to-peer networks. I've talked to people here in California, and we have people inside the government designed a fully encrypted peer-to-peer network that the government and the NSA cannot and will not and never can hack through a hackless environment. <clears throat> they know if we start disconnecting from their, quote, economic system, which might happen after a crash, that uh, their power and control is gone. They also know if a coronal mass ejection hits, like we just missed one two weeks ago, their ability to control a population when satellites go down and power grids go down becomes zero. The only thing that they can do is on the stand on the sidelines and try to protect themselves in nuclear-powered little silos underground they call hotels because the only force that's going to be above ground will not be military. It will be civilian militia and gangs, period. Everything else is irrelevant. So the idea of people talking about martial law, we have martial law right now to the extent that people are being snooped on and monitored and terrorized. But the government cannot bring about martial law. It's impossible unless they get us to cooperate with something like an airborne plague or financial disaster where they have to make people beg for the next bowl of gruel. Uh, Other than that, there's no way for them to do martial law. It ain't going to happen. can't happen. It doesn't even matter if the country's disarmed. You have to disarm people eventually, you piss them off enough, they'll find some way of getting a hold of some kind of weapons and guns. But here in America, with the number of people in the history of America, when I hear people say about martial law, martial law, we got martial law right now. 
Your home is your cell. Your cell phone is your cell, and they can track it. Your your Twitter account and the national ID, which they kicked down the can from mass May of this year, has a tracker chip in it, has a biometric ID, and they can ask DHS can ask for any new information they want. Terrorist body scan, no problem. DNA endonuclease, uh, Building 10, Affymetrix, Chicago, Building 10, Oak Ridge National Lab, DNA biochip to determine your DNA from anybody else, no problem. They can ask for anything, and you can't refuse it because it's a national biometric ID, which was passed in 2009. They even tried to snipe it on the side of this immigration bill with a gang of eight. So when people talk about martial law, we got it now. But this is as far as they can go until we cooperate by having an airborne plague, a financial catastrophe, or natural disaster like the coronal mass ejection. And without the public's cooperation, there's no such thing as martial law. If the government loses total control with a power grid down or with uh, you know, what we call real terrorism, where the black ski mask guys can start knocking on doors and smashing people down and so on and killing people, uh, it'll be like the British with a big cross on their chest. We'll know who to kill. So the, the police and Delta Force and special ops teams in New York State beg the governor not to enforce a law they already have on the books this year that says they can SWAT team your ass anywhere. Now, they SWAT team 80,000 families and homes this year in America by federal forces. They continue SWAT team, and we're going to SWAT their ass. They're not going to live long if they continue doing this. There'll be vets there when they go start seizing guns uh, from vets at uh, you know 3 in the morning. They're going to find guys on the roof, rocket-propelled grenades, armor-piercing weapons, uh, tracks blown off their APCs, roads blown up so you can't get away, and it's going to be a mess. It will not be so fun as dealing with Iraqis on the road to, to Baghdad Airport. It's going to get ugly to the nth level. And if they think they're going to take on Americans and just roll over us, think again. We're not afraid of dying. We're not afraid of our blood or yours. And if you think you can do this, you better stop dreaming this dream because it's going to end up a nightmare. What do you think, Ann? Well, I remember what I was told, and that was that it's going to end up a war between the gangs and the police. And, and no, no, the police aren't even involved. So no, the police are it. going to become part of the civilian militia. So is the sheriffs. The sheriffs, the police, and the citizens will form one side, and the gangs are going to get their ass kicked. Yes. That's the way it I, is, okay? That's the way it is. The gangs have gotten too many people who lack discipline, lack physical health, lack training, and they may have a bunch of weapons, but it doesn't mean squat if you can't shoot straight and if you're on drugs or you're dehydrated and you're properly, improperly nourished. Being younger doesn't save your ass if you don't have training and discipline. Well, and that's why I think everybody needs to be prepared to protect themselves until the, until right. the gangs are gone. Right. Well, again, a lot of the gang members will actually turn over and become part of the civilian militia, too. A lot of people think, oh, it'll all just go bad. I think, no, some of them will kind of get it. They realize this is stupid. Why fight against citizens that are going to outnumber you dramatically and uh, lose? And you'll see that happen, too. But the police will become part of the civilian militia and the military, and the idea that you're going to see military officers being ordered to start fragging citizens or doing stuff, not going to happen. If an officer orders that, he's going to have his brain splattered all over the wall in about 35 seconds. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and um, we're going to post up a number of uh, websites, and uh, I'll rattle them off quickly, uh, but I'm going to actually post them up on the site and make sure that the URLs are correct. uvb.nrel.colostate.edu forward slash uvb, and cpc.ncep.noaa.gov forward slash products forward slash stratosphere forward slash uv underscore index Correct. and then the third one is uvawareness.com which will give you an hourly uv index and you just put your zip code in and of course you mentioned mexico city this weekend will be hit a record level of 14 what's going on is and i uh, listened to dane wigington who's been investigating this for 10 years the problem is uh, dane has picked up parts of the problem looking at geoengineering as a primary cause of uv light surge and increases uh, and, 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 you know, looked at the issue of Fukushima Daiichi as a binary factor. 
the major factor is actually just the output of the sun. And we talked about this with uh, Professor McCanny. The sun is putting out more dangerous radiation than it has been for a third of a century, and it's been gradually increasing and increasing at an ever-increasing pace of ultraviolet B light and C and D. And according to uh, Tandale, the two new bands since 1992, 21 years ago, are in the C and D light bands. A will tan you, B will burn you, C can give you cancer and suppress your immune system, and is very high energetic, so it goes right through clothing, most clothing, except for the U, what's called the UV protection clothing, which you can specially order. And no UV uh, protection, by the way, cream can stop the UVC. Uh, UVD is so powerful, it'll go right to the side of a building because it's right before x-rays. So uh, UVD is bad stuff. Uh, so bricks and mortar just barely stop it. It gives you an yeah, idea just how powerful these are. Yeah, we're seeing skin cancer now, melanoma in 35-year-olds. Right. Now, what they do is cause DNA adducts. They literally attach them, which create a thing called thymidine dimerization. And the thymidine uh, molecules in your in your uh, DNA and RNA get cross-linked, and the DNA can properly unzip and form new uh, replications. So you get the broken DNA or what's called codon slip. So there's a technical reason for why it don't work. As they say, it don't work. So well, what people need to know is the technical answers are Dane Wigginton did some good work. Geoengineering is damaging it. The reason why they put this radiomagnetic mirror up, and I talked about this last night on the Rents Network because I'm on every Thursday, usually the second hour, usually the second week, the third hour on Thursdays, is three reasons. They put the uh, high-altitude particles not according to the um, uh, original uh, uh, Edward Teller idea over 20,000 miles off the Earth, but they put it in the upper troposphere at 73 to 80,000 feet, which is bad. And what it's doing is these are paramagnetic molecules, barium nanoparticles, aluminum nanoparticles, and thorium nanoparticles. And by the way, one in 50 thorium atoms is radioactive. These are all paramagnetic. They're incredibly neurotoxic, vasotoxic, and toxic to the intermycorrhizae, which is the lichens that actually allow the rhizomes of plants and trees to actually pull nutrients and minerals in. So combined with the UV shock that's happening to kill the trees, we have basically mineral depletion because these heavy metals are causing heavy metal poisoning of all the living things on Earth, including us. And then they put it up there for three reasons. First, you need to create a radiomagnetic mirror to literally deflect into space the plasma field and the, and the uh, proton storm that occurs with the CME to protect the Earth and its communications uh, from this kind of problem. Of course, it's not going to stop the communication satellites because they're above that, but it will protect the power grid. The second is to use what's called toroidal torsion field imaging to map out all the three-dimensional resources, oil, gold, everything under the Earth and under the oceans. And the third is to create a plasma interferometry uh, weapon where they can literally create a plasma explosion over any city up to 100 megatons or bigger, basically within minutes without firing a missile over any city on Earth. And to use it also as a radiomagnetic uh, induction system to induce what's called geotectonics or earthquake weapon <clears throat> from space by putting in interferometry fields set to the harmonic frequency of the tectonic plates to reach what's called the piezoelectric slip threshold. Uh, they can also move the jet stream to change weather, and they have supercomputer models where they perturb it in specific places, and they can remotely affect weather continents away by the butterfly effect. So that's the main reasons. Then the second level of chemtrails we see changing the albedo of the Earth are mid-level flights coming out of jet aircraft and commercial aircraft, and those form those fluffy clouds that can turn the sky gray into a hot cross bun. And the third level are what's called low-altitude sprays of things like... Um, the fluorescent bacteria and other organisms to measure how they could spray an area to kill a crops or people with a pathogen. They've been doing that since they had the early planes in the 1920s. So uh, those are the three programs. A lot of people don't know the details. I do. Uh, I know them in exquisite detail, but that's a summary. And what they need to understand is that what is being done is by we already have global government, and there's an interface between our globalist bankers and our United Nations, which is what I call the human interface to a much more demonic and transdimensional powers that are in place now on the earth. People, I won't get into the details of it, but it's pretty dang scary. If it wasn't for the fact I have faith and know the Most High God, I'd completely freak out. But I know my God is God. So are you talking about these transdimensional travelers that's coming from another universe or another galaxy? Yeah, but they're, they're, I wouldn't call them... Uh, UFOs because they've been here. These fiendish beings have been here forever. Oh, okay. For example, it talks about in the Bible 
the 200 that landed on Mount Horeb and, and hybridized with humans to create the Nephilim, and the giants of old, the, the mighty men, the demigods, this is real. This is not made up in the imaginations of, quote, the ancient pop prophets or whatever, or they said it as an allegory. This is real. What they need to understand is we have the modern Nephilim literally here on Earth, and their proxies are the people of clay and iron that are being avatared like Obama, probably created through sex magic rituals and human sacrifice and God knows what, so that his body and his, and his person is being avatared and driven like a car. Uh, as the president to do policies that are anti-American and anti-human. Same with Hillary Clinton. She is a very large, very tall, very wide, very nasty, Draco reptilian transdimensional avataring her frame or human husk, sufficiently cursed by her ancestors through hundreds of generations. Well, do they only inhabit uh, certain people, or do you have to be Christian it's in order not to be inhabited, or how does that work? Uh, it works because of these families have used these bloodlines of control. If you actually follow the bloodlines, for example, the blood, black nobility of uh, Venezia, you can track them back through uh, Constantinople and ancient Greece, and you can go right back to Atlantis, to the same people genetically. In fact, you can see a picture, a statue of uh, <clears throat> of Nero, in Rome, and he's a dead ringer for Bill Clinton. Oh, oh yeah, okay. He yeah. looks just like him. I mean, you look at him, so whoa, Bill, how'd you get back there? <laughs> he's a dead ringer. Dead ringer looks just like him. Like Bill, I hope you don't have Nero tendencies, but I think we have those now in the Abominator. He has a perfect name for it too: the Abomination that shall desolate. The deconstructor of America, they should have him on. They should have him out there when he gets to his teleprompter. One of the Secret Service passes him his helmet and has a little map of America with a wrecking ball hitting it. Well, if they close the embassies in the Middle East, what do the Americans who are traveling in the Middle East do if they get into trouble? Pray. Hmm. Keep your head down. Look Arab. Wear one of these Arab hats. Cover your face. Learn how to say Alu Akbar and other Arab sayings. Make sure you give bakshish on Friday. <laughs> Don't offend anybody until you get out of there. Well, I thought that was one reason we had embassies, was to help our people that were over there. Embassies are, are a sham. Look, just look what they did to... Uh, to uh, you know, the U.S. have a policy, we don't leave, don't leave any Americans behind. Hogwash. They purposely left them behind because they're covering it up. We have a criminal cabal that's taken over the government. And uh, you mentioned an interesting report here about these viruses. And I've said in I have three levels of information. We have the Bible, we have prophecy, and we have really good sources. Now we have a real good source with ProMedMail.com, ProMedMail.com. And you can look through these articles, and it's like, whoa. And uh, these bugs are, uh, I believe, we're going to see a bank blow to the bond market and airborne plagues hit this fall. The government with the Mideast, obviously, are planning on something big. Uh, perfect time to do it after they've been harassed by both parties not happy and almost passing a law to shackle the NSA, no such agency, on snooping on us. So it's either that or real stuff happening. It's either to cover the snoop attitudes of the government that are globalist, or it's real terrorism about to happen, which, by the way, was the Center of Brothers. They watched it. They shepherded it. They didn't do anything to interfere with it, even after the Russians warned us, because they wanted it to happen because it's good for their business. Bad. So look out. The minions that put sock puppet Obama are on the warpath, and it's probably going to get bad before it gets catastrophic. 